All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my channel. I am Thomas and I do educational videos on many different subjects. Today we're talking about the reciprocal system of theory developed by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century and updated in the 21st century by Dr. Bruce Perrette um, uh, and others. And um, this is a theory of everything that Mr. Larson developed. And uh, he has many books on the topic. I think this is the 27th video that I've done in this series. And the fifth one that is covering his final book that's called Beyond Space and Time. Beyond Space and Time was uh, was the only book that he took to uh, move beyond um, science, uh, social science, uh, into the liberal arts and uh, into the realm of the metaphysical. Most of his books are on uh, physical, uh, chemistry, physics, astronomy, uh, but he also has a couple books on economics. But this book delved into philosophy, psychology, um, and religion, among others. And um, some of his followers claimed that uh, it was blasphemy to publish this book, which came out after he died. And, um, you know, that these are just his own private writings, and he would never want to have this come out uh, and kind of uh, defile the uh, science, you know, the high scientific work that he did uh, before this. So, uh, you know, that's another issue. Um, now, we are, uh, now the basics of the theory, uh, again, you would probably want to go back to the beginning here of my, um, uh, going back to the beginning of of um, this these videos back to uh, number one and at least number a or letter a for the entire um, for the entire book uh, this book but I would uh, go back to all and watch all the videos to figure out what's going on but if you want to give it a try to uh, pick up here where we left off, uh, maybe uh, you can follow along. I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of help here by just um, at least giving you the two uh, fundamental postulates before we start. So the first postulate, the physical universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And the second fundamental postulate, the uh, physical universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. Okay, now, those are the two postulates. It took Larson, uh, I think, about 20 years to arrive at those two postulates through a process of inductive reasoning, um, taking what he already knew, specific instances, specific facts, specific measurements, that he uh, observations that he already knew, and then attempting to apply it to a general situation. And he said that, you know, the induct, induction is a, an element of probability, you know, uh, and if you have millions and millions of specific instances, um, they all can point to this generalized uh, situation, then your probability is so high that it's beyond negligible, it's beyond a mathematical certainty. Um, and uh, then, so once he had these postulates, he went on a deductive reasoning process of saying, if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that, and that is what's uh, what I documented or what he he spoke about in his 1986 speech, the outline of the deductive development of the reciprocal system. And so I went over that uh, for about 15 episodes 
uh, just prior to this. So that kind of shows you how his thinking, uh, how his thinking goes as far as constructing this, as far as the physical theory. The, you know, most of it is having to do with uh, you know, how he figured out uh, what an atom is, what an electron is, what a photon is, and how they all work together. Now, uh, by this point, he's beyond that, and he's already written all of his books, and he's musing on how to apply his theory to metaphysical, beyond the physical. And... Uh, he ends up going back to the process of inductive reasoning, uh, but also he, uh, he uses, you know, the basic approach that he, that he uh, crafted out of, the, uh, out of the scientific theory. Okay, so the basic idea is that Larson, in, uh, like say Einstein's theory, the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. Nothing moves faster than the speed of light. And in Larson's theory, the speed of light, uh, given the universe is made out of motion, the speed, so, so there's always motion. There's no time or space where there is no motion. Um, there's no you know, everything is made out of motion. So if you don't have motion, you don't have anything. So, you know, the, the theory of Larson presupposes motion. So there's always going to be motion. So in Larson's system, where, you know, in Einstein's system, the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. In Larson's system, the speed of light is the pre-existing condition of the universe and the speed of light is the neutral point of the universe and so he's got this you know the speed of light is like the boundary uh you know he refers to like the box uh where uh you know if you have a box you have an uh you have a box and the box is the speed of light and the inside of the box it uh is also um comes to be just from the fact of having the box and the outside of the box also comes to be as a fact of having the box so when you get the box you get three things you know a trinity you don't get just the box you get the inside and the outside and the inside of the box for Larson is like the physical universe the part of the universe that we're accustomed to that is the part of the universe where speeds are lower than the speed of light. Okay, so that kind of in, agrees with what Einstein is saying. Um, you know, but Einstein is really only applying his theory to the physical universe, saying that the physical universe, uh, you know, for the physical universe, the speed of light is the maximum speed. But Larson is extending his theory to the metaphysical universe, and that is... Uh, what he calls the cosmic sector. And in this cosmic sector, the speed of light is, um, is really the, the low point, you know, the, the lowest uh, speed that is permissible in the cosmic universe. Everything moves faster than the speed of light. And uh, Larson eventually was able to kind of figure out that that uh, has to do with metaphysical um, things, things such as intelligence, um, consciousness, uh, perhaps. And, um, you know, so he, uh, in this, in this uh, book, he gets into, you know, emotions and thinking, memory, um, free will, communication, these things all are re related for Larson to the metaphysical uni universe, to the universe that goes faster than the speed of light. Now, the process that he uses is, you know, what you call extrapolation, where, uh, you know, he, he, from that first postulate, 
he's saying that you know motion has two reciprocal aspects space and time and so um if space and time are reciprocals of each other then um what you really have is you have this slower than the speed of light sector of the universe where um you basically have uh, three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time or scalar times time is just progressing flowing and then over here you have really three-dimensional time and space is progressing everything is getting further and further apart um so but what he's saying is that if we can come up with uh, ob observations, measurements, and the like in the material universe, we can um, we can extrapolate them to the metaphysical universe, to the faster than the speed of light universe, because of this reciprocal relationship. And all you really have to do is invert space and time. Um, you know, take all the qual qualities that are related to space over here in the material universe and attribute them to time over here in the cosmic universe. So that is where he kind of gets back to the inductive reasoning. Um, so he's saying we have, a, a, I think this is chapter three, um, chapter four called Reaching Outward. And he's saying, that the universe itself, the physical universe, is a special type of existence. Um, so, uh, or he, later he calls it a special type of motion. So he's taking this special type or this specific type of existence and he's attempting to apply it to the generalized situation, which would be both sides of the equation. So, you know, there he gets and he's talking about deductive reasoning. Deductive process is complete in itself. And if sound reasoning is applied, you know, you can you arrive at physical physically certain um, answers, conclusions. Induction, on the other hand, is a probability. Induction is therefore an incomplete process, uh, which we also requires verification. Uh, so the equivalent of deduction is not induction alone, but induction plus verification. Uh, the basic process of induction is simple enumeration. If the number of observed units is immense, as is often the case, the probability is so great that it is equivalent to physical certainty without any further verification. A somewhat less reliable form of extrapolation, uh, which has a, a lower degree of probability, uh, but and then analogy even has a lower degree of probability. So those are those are the three or, or three different kinds of um, inductive reasoning that he's using. He's attempting to do it through enumeration, just having so many specific instances that it applies. Um, it becomes mathematically impossible that it's wrong. I did this a million times and it, it happened that it did the same thing every time. So therefore, I'm concluding that it's generally that's what happens. An analog uh, extrapolation is, you know, where you're 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 taking a you're kind of making the argument that this situation is similar to that situation or, or identical to that situation. And so therefore, if it applies over here, it also applies over here. That's what he's doing with these two different sectors of the universe. He's extrapolating uh, the uh, results from over here in the material universe where we can measure over here to the metaphysical universe where we can't measure. Now, just remember the kind of the dicta here. We can't, we can't see time. We only can see space. And so, but we can know time through this reciprocal relation. Once we learn space, then we can apply it to time. So that's the extrapolation. And then the lower, even lower degree of probability is the analogy uh, since an entity 
A has property X, some entity B that resembles A in certain respects also has property X. So this is where uh, the, the identity, the entity B only resembles A. It's not uh, identical or a reciprocal. It's just a, a resemblance. Um, and then he talks about uh, concomitant variations in which a connection between X and Y is inferred from the fact that the analysis shows that factors which cause a change in X also cause a change in, of a related nature in Y. Okay, now, now he says the obstacle standing in the way of constructing such a system is an error of some kind in current thinking. Philosophers long ago concluded that the physical universe is a universe of motion. Okay, so now he's talking about Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes, who also concluded that the physical universe is a universe of motion. Okay, now again, the ancient Greeks believed that the universe was made out of atoms. It was made out of matter. And then, you know, 25 centuries later, Einstein comes along you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, and he's saying that, no, e equals mc squared, energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. It looks like matter, but it's really energy. Uh, the universe is made out of energy. And Larson then comes along 25 years later or so, and he says, no, uh, if e equals mc squared and energy can be converted into matter and vice versa, that means that neither one of them can be the most fundamental thing in the universe. It has to be something that underlies both of them, and that's what motion is. So, Lars, so that's how Larson comes to this. Now, but he says that Descartes and Hobbes and so on have, uh, were able to come to that conclusion as well, but they were unable to verify this conclusion until the error in the prevailing concept of the nature of space and time was corrected. So he's saying that you have to redefine space and time before you can actually kind of proceed, uh, you know, uh, constructively with this universe of motion hypothesis. When these entities are seen, the entities of space and time are seen in their true light as aspects of the substance of the universe rather than the setting of the universe, uh, then it, things become clear. So the universe is made out of motion. Motion is the relationship between space and time. So the universe is made out of space and time. They are the substance of the universe. We perceive them as being the setting of the universe. Like, uh, you know, we are in space. Like space is the stage that we're acting upon. And we're in time. Time is the stage that we're acting upon. But it's not the, it's not, the substance, you know, it's, we're not saying that we ourselves are space and time. We're saying that we're these independent characters acting in space and time. Larson is saying that we are space and time. And so we, so space and time are the contents, not the container, you know, so that's where he's making the distinction. We are the, uh, we are, not in space and time, we are space and time. Now, um, he also uses this thing called the principle of plenitude. Whatever can exist, does exist. Okay, so if it's not outlawed by the laws, then it does exist. And so now he's setting the stage for going back into the uh, inductive reasoning. Um, he identifies the physical universe as a special or specific case of motion in general. And that enables us to extrapolate the information of the unrestricted type that is available about this special case to the general situation, which includes the metaphysical. And so now he's saying to utilize the designation metaphysical in its etymological sense as referring to all that is beyond physics. Outside, he says, as used in this connection means simply not a part of. 
so not a part of the physical or the physics, and has no spatial or temporal implications. The question as to the existence of other universes is purely academic. There are existences in the metaphysical region of a more general and less restricted type extrapolated to existence in general uh, is the principle that existence is logical, orderly, and rational. And so then he extrapolates and he says that, you know, if our universe that we are familiar with, that we measure, if that universe is logical, orderly, and rational, then by extrapolation, the metaphysical universe is also logical, orderly, and rational. But it just doesn't appear so because we, we don't really know how to be approaching this metaphysical universe. And so we see all these absurdities and all of this chaos. Um, but if we actually looked at it the right way, mainly by inverting space and time and by seeing it as time over space and by seeing the three-dimensional time set, uh, you know, as, you know, kind of the, the setting, the three-dimensional time um, and a space that is progressing, then we would be able to see this properly as logical, orderly, and rational. The metaphysical existences of which we have evidence are intelligent. Um, so that's where he's gotten so far. We're going to look at uh, the other postulates, but this is his third postulate then. The metaphysical existences are li likewise logical, orderly, and rational. Okay, we'll see you next time.